So I think that, Councillor, and now that we're in the formal meeting, the issue that you raised before, that's a good example of if you are worrying about what the recommendations about that might be, yeah. that's a good Starting. time to just kind of sit with the staff and go, look, in case that happens, this is where we'd like some, some work to be done. So we're, we're starting to pre-prepare. Yeah. Wouldn't we be rejecting any independent hearing panel recommendation that, that didn't follow what we wanted in mediation? I, th I, I think we've already had a position. I think if you look at the, the slides going forward, we it, it's really important to Auckland that the unitary plan becomes operative as soon as practicable because of the issues that we have about we've still got over 10 legacy plans out there causing confusion and um, costs to people across the, the council and those legacy plans are not necessarily delivering the outcomes that you have um, championed and promoted in the unitary plan. We also have the um, the impact on achieving some of the strategic outcomes that you're all keen to achieve, both environmental, social, and um, from a, um, a growth point of view. And so if we reject everything that is not in total accordance with what we took into the hearings panel, we will end up with a, a plan that has no effect whatsoever. Um, and that gets back to the conversation that uh, the Chair has raised, is that we will need to be giving you advice about we consider these are really fundamental strategic issues that you need to keep consider carefully because the recommendation of the panel is contrary to the strategic position this council has indicated in various times as opposed to they didn't accept our argument on this point but actually looking at it we believe we can live with it because it's not really um, an outcome that could be catastrophic. And in that, there might be some of those that we say, and we believe there's an opportunity after the plan becomes operative to um, do plan changes to take yeah. us back further to yeah. the position we were aiming for. Yep. We don't know whether, how many of those there'll be, but we certainly will be looking at it that way. But pragmatically, I don't think we can be rejecting everything the panel recommends that's not in accordance with the council's position um, because then the plan will not be operative for um, some time to come and that will be challenging for everybody. Okay, Councillor Walker. Yeah, just, just picking up on this because it's real um, between a rock and a hard place um, stuff. Um, just looking at the reasoning in the Section 32 analysis, it, it looks like we've got three categories of, um, of, of stuff. There's what the unitary plan panel comes up with, and I'm assuming that they've got some Section 32 analysis that's supporting their decision making? Yes, okay. correct. So, yeah. so that's one thing to work off. We've got our position, and obviously our Section 32 analysis that supports that. And then we've got the submitters, and they're going to be submitters on one side and submitters on the other side. And you'd assume that they've got uh, <coughs> evidence and the like that um, supports that. And the nature of that evidence, and especially the Section 32 analysis, is going to have a huge bearing on our um, ability to make a call and knocking something back. Um, if I look at the alternative um, uh, solution, the other thing that's relevant is it may be that our um, solution is a collateral solution, that is, it impacts on other parts of the proposed unitary plan, because we might be saying, look, um, we don't want to have so much density there, but there's some density here that meets the requirement, um, and that could go to any of those positions that those various um, people, the, you know, the panel, the, us and the, and the submitters have, have made. So I, I really just want to put on the table that we're going to need to have um, as much of an indication around the adequacy of evidence to support our, our call um, as early as we can. And I can tell you 
if you search the, the, um, the, the site, if you haven't done a lot of it, it's really hard to get your head around where stuff is and, and evidence and, and all sorts of things. So, yeah. yeah. I think um, the panel's been doing that. Well, I... It's going to be tough. Well, okay, Councillor Penrose. Oh, I just wanted to, uh, to um, follow up on um, um, the spirit there in regards to the comments because if there's one thing that's confusing across the region, um, for the lame person out there, we they just think that you know we're one council now, we should have one plan, and that's not the case. And this is what we're rubbing up against all the time. So the, the quicker this process is in place, and as you say, we can mop up sort of after afterwards and uh, tidy some stuff up. So you know, we just got to get on with it. Councillor Wood. Oh no, no. I just uh, make the point that um, I, I don't think uh, we aren't going to have all the evidence that. Um, Obviously, the panel's deliberated on to make the decisions. It'll be a pretty high-level um, yes or no decision on on different points. Of, I mean, I'd say that in most of the issues, the councillors will probably, um, well, hopefully, will be able to live with the decision of the panel. Mm -hmm. Some councillors may have some decisions, and I think we'll just have to have a a general, a quick debate, and as to whether we support any. Any change or any any there's any support and then move on because uh, it's not as if we are going to re-litigate what this panel has spent you know a year and a half doing so um, I think that's the big the big issue here um, yeah. we haven't we haven't heard the deliberations so uh, we're um, a very high level um, overview mm -hmm. and then we'll have to make decisions and move on. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. I've got um, Mayor Brown, and then we'll finish the legal presentation and see how we're doing for time. No, not me. Mayor Brown. Yeah. No? You're, you're no, right? Brown. Okay, <coughs> cool. Oh, Madam Chair. Okay. Yep. Is that a wrap? Yeah. Um, as far as if we go to, um, if we're giving our community or whatever the assurance that there could be um, to tidy things up, as Cullum said, you know, a private plan change down the track, and that will mean that we can uh, get the entry plan operative and avoid appeals from other submitters and that. What will that actually look like? Would we be resolving as a committee, um, you know, formally that, that we, that council will, after, uh, uh, council after passing the unitary plan will then begin a process of a private plan change? Or is it how we, because if we go back to our concerned community, for example, and say, oh yeah, m there might be a private plan <coughs> change down the track by the next council, um, that's probably not going to give them the comfort that, that we might need to give them. And so I just wanted to see, uh, you know, how formal can we get about a pending private plan change and council's intentions uh, in, as we are ratifying the unitary plan. So, um, just to be clear, it, it would be a public plan change because okay. it would be one promoted okay. by the council, yeah, okay. not, yeah. not by a um, private individual. Yeah, okay. We have already had some um, indications from the panel in their guidance that they believe in their own recommendations to the council they might be recommending that the council undertakes um, further plan changes, and those will be, particularly they've given that guidance in the, the areas around requests for new scheduled items, and that their concern was that they have not had the time or the information to support adding lots and lots of new heritage items or new other items that uh, people are seeking to protect. So the way that they, they've indicated already that the way that they would deal with those would be to recommend to the council that certain plan changes happen after the plan has been adopted by the council. Uh, so we will need to, through those um, three days of considering the recommendations of the panel, the council will need to form a view about whether or not it accepts that it will undertake those recommended plan changes. And so I see no reason why, if through the conversations that you have and the discussions around um, those meetings, that if there are areas that the council is happy to accept the recommendation of the panel but will be looking to improve or enhance or slightly amend those through a plan change that you as a council 
could not make a recommendation that actually says, and this will be on the work program. Okay, can we, so we can resolve our intention. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, obviously, we would not have been able to draft up a plan change no, in time for it to be immediately notified, but you can set motion. the yep. work program in place uh, for the, the planning team to actually start undertaking them going forward. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Oh, good clarification, that one. Okay, right, let's do the last two slides, James. Okay, so um, this slide deals with the issue of out-of-scope um, submissions. Can the Council accept recommendations that are beyond the scope of submissions? To be clear, what's happening here is that the Independent Hearings Panel has looked at all the submissions. It may come up with a recommendation which is beyond what those submissions provided for, and it can make that recommendation to Council. Um, council can accept that. Uh, but uh, the legislation also requires, and we'll know exactly when it is that we're accepting something that is out of scope as identified by the panel, because the panel in its, um, in its recommendations will tell you it is out of scope. So we can accept those, um, or indeed uh, reject them. Um, in relation to uh, appeal rights, uh, we've uh, dealt with this previously. It was on the comparison table um, that I uh, took you through earlier on. Um, the same points are made there. Just one point I'll, um, I'll uh, bring up is that it's not someone who's adversely affected. It's someone who's unduly prejudiced uh, in that uh, last bullet point there. So if someone is unduly prejudiced um, by... A, a, an out-of-scope recommendation, then they will have appeal rights. Okay. So and Cal Councillor Cooper, did you want to explore that? That was, I think, yeah, I, I just, yeah, that is just the issue, isn't it? Is that there are no further submissions once we get the recommendations, yeah. and people can't just go, I don't like that the council have accepted these recommendations now. That's it. It's only if we reject recommendations um, and if they're a submitter that someone can appeal and it's only if we accept recommendations that unduly prejudice someone. So it can't be a general member of the public that says, I don't like that my friend two suburbs away is un unduly prejudiced. So that's what I'm trying to tease out. It can't be a madding hordes, you know, at the door. No, it's got to be unduly prejudiced and show how they... They are. That's exactly yeah. the same process yeah. for um, any um, exactly. uh, any plan change yep. matter. It's only those who've been involved who can uh, appeal, or in the case of this accepting other scope recommendations, uh, anyone who's unduly affected. But the the pool of people who can be involved in the environment court process is relatively narrow. So, just so it's not open yeah. slather. But yeah. supplementary to that, can then somebody who says, I'm also unduly prejudiced by the same decision, can they join as a 274 party as in other appeals, or is that not available? Uh, that's something I'd need to give uh, consideration to. Okay. Because it isn't the same as the RMA, this is it. It's, it's a, it's a bolt-on piece. Well, that, that's where the, the complexity comes in, yep. as to how much of the RMA is imported into that that's particular what I'm process. Saying is a lot of to... people are saying during this whole process, oh, the RMA says this and that, but we've got different considerations and pieces of legislation that govern this, and that's all. So that's what I'm trying to tease out. Yep, good. that's good to know. We'll find out that some other time when you've considered it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Walker. Just in terms of unduly prejudiced, um, could you expand on that? And I'd suggest that um, people out there are going to want to um, have some idea of what that might cover, because most people will make <coughs> the assumption that it's around being adversely affected, not prejudiced. Yes, as I mentioned at the beginning of uh, this meeting, uh, I don't want to get into uh, giving legal advice on some of these issues which might actually have to be determined ultimately by the Environment Court. Um, and if someone is wanting to appeal, they'll need to get their own independent legal advice as to whether or not um, they're unduly prejudiced. It's not something that we've uh, 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 unpacked in terms of uh, considering what it might mean for council. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and it's uh, something that we can provide further advice on. Okay, well, just, just further to that then, uh, I know when we had a, um, a conversation um, the other day, I can't remember where it was, 
the um, notion was, or the suggestion that council could have some form of um, public forum facility that it might um, assist, so that people are able to communicate information easily for other people to find. That uh, we don't. We've talked um, about that. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm just putting it on the table again, um, so that. Um, they can communicate and they have some form of voice and that doesn't mean to say that it's something that we're condoning but it could cover off things like unduly prejudiced and other things. Okay. So we're going to come back to, to some of that, Councillor Walker. 